I will present the video and the presentation from Mika Maret, who is adjunct lecturer on hydrogen markets, diplomacy, and geopolitics at Sciences Po, uh, the Paris Institute of Political Studies. So people who know uh, what is Sciences Po, it's like, you know, the most VIP, the most prestigious inst uh, educational institution in, in France, and uh, a lot of ministers, government officials, they are studying there. And what is interesting, so Miko is a professor at three universities, and he's just 34 years old. Uh, he's uh, working with German government, with French government, with the European Commission. He was helping to prepare strategies for free countries, for hydrogen strategies. And uh, I am very proud because actually, together with Miko. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Miko Blujon Mered. I'm calling from Paris. Um, and I'll be basically providing just a few data some data to help you with your debates at the Corvadis Green Hydrogen Second Global Green Hydrogen Forum at Ray in India. Uh, I have a few slides to share with you. I'm not going to be super long. I'll try to be at least. Uh, the idea is to really provide you with hard data so that you can keep uh, going forward with, you, with your debates, um, especially on the fact that green hydrogen policies are moving forward in many countries in the world, while actually green hydrogen investments are actually maybe slowing down, or actually, I would say, not delivering. So in a nutshell, this is where we're starting from, or at least my starting point. Uh, I'm, appro I'm approaching green hydrogen from a carbon budget perspective. Uh, the idea of approaching it from a carbon budget perspective basically means that based on the amount of CO2 equivalent emissions that our atmosphere can still absorb in a plus 1.5 degrees Celsius or plus 2 degrees Celsius scenario that will give us the, how can I put this, the rhythm, the pace at which we must invest in green hydrogen and of course in renewables. Uh, so basically this is where we're starting from here. As of January 2020, according to the IPCC, our atmosphere could still absorb for the 1.5 degree scenario, 400 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, and for the plus two scenario, 1,150 uh, gigatons of CO2. So basically, based on the fact that we currently emit approximately 40 gigatons globally um, of CO2 equivalent every year, then basically the idea is that at our current rate, we'll only have six years six years ahead of us before we burn that carbon uh, threshold for the plus 1.5 degrees Celsius scenario. For the plus two, it's a little bit better. We have 25 years, <laughs> but 25 years is not a long time. It's just one investment cycle. So basically any investment we're doing now in hydrogen, if it's not green, hydrogen, it's not contributing to this, period. If you're doing blue, you're not contributing to this. If you're doing gray, of course, you're not contributing to this. It got, it's got to be green now so that your investments now or in the next five years can actually deliver or help deliver uh, this plus two degree scenario in less than 25 years. That's what we're talking about here. In a nutshell, when we're talking about net zero in 2050 in the EU, in the US, in Japan, Korea, or many other places in the world, Basically, what we mean is that as of today, we only have 9,585 days remaining to deliver this carbon neutral world. Time is going so fast, definitely. So in that context, of course, green hydrogen can have an impact, a strong impact. And I really urge you to read uh, this report, if you haven't already, from the IRENA, from the International Renewable Energy Agency on the geopolitics of hydrogen. Uh, in the energy transformation, basically what you will see is a number of figures, uh, which I've summarized here on this slide, that tell you the amount of investments, the amount of political capital that we need to put in all of these, um, in all of these aspects. But we're in 2023 now, 
And this is our starting point. As of 2023, or rather, actually as of 2022, and we're compiling the data now in 2023, so this is, of course, the 2022 figures. Um, as of today, if you allow me uh, to, to say today, this is where we're starting from. Only 0.1% of the global hydrogen production now in the world is green hydrogen. Only 0.1%. you are going to tell me it's better than last year, meaning in 2021, because in 2021, uh, green hydrogen was... 0.04% of the global hydrogen production. So 0.1 is better, but hey, this is definitely uh, where we're starting from. And this is definitely a critical to know that we're lacking green hydrogen at the moment. We're not going as fast as we should. So given that the whole industry is more or less uh, based on fossil fuels, 99.9% of this industry is based on fossil fuels, uh, then, of course, these figures right here on the global emissions associated with hydrogen production, well, they will not surprise you, right? So more than 900 million tons of CO2 equivalents emitted every year by the hydrogen industry, that basically means that the hydrogen industry today emits more than 2.2% of global CO2 emissions. That is just as much as the aviation sector which is, of course, named and shamed uh, all the time, especially in the US or in Europe. So definitely, it's only a matter of time. If the hydrogen industry doesn't switch to renewables and green hydrogen, it's only a matter of time before the global audience, um, the, the, the public opinion, almost everywhere in the world, starts also questioning the hydrogen industry instead of seeing it as being part of the solution. And that, of course, would be a disaster, not only for the industry, but for our climate targets, because the literature is consistent, whether academic, whether coming from consultancies and so on, or government, it's actually pretty consistent. Without hydrogen, we will not be able to deliver a net zero world. So, of course, we're having now a new, like it's not the first one, of course, wave of hydrogen hype all over the world. Um, the idea, the reason why we're having this hype again is because virtually anyone, any country in the world, any industrial producer uh, can basically switch to hydrogen one way or another, and especially to green hydrogen. What you're seeing on this graph here, on this map, is the hydrogen production potential from wind power. You see that basically there's poten production potential pretty much everywhere uh, when it comes to solar PV, solar PV thermal. Once again, the potential is spread all over the world. And of course, India fares very well uh, in these aspects. So definitely there's a huge potential. When it comes to India specifically, of course, we also have hydropower, uh, which also can produce a lot of green hydrogen. So there's plenty of ways to imagine how to connect green hydrogen with renewables uh, upstream. But on top of that, on top of this aspect that any, virtually anyone could produce hydrogen, in the EU, which is likely to be the main off-taker of hydrogen in the short and medium run, uh, what we have is an energy sovereignty crisis, which is, of course, fueled, or I should say aggravated, because it pre-existed the war in Ukraine. It's been only aggravated by the war in Ukraine. So definitely, in the EU, of course, coming from Paris, got to talk about the EU, well, we're experiencing here an energy sovereignty crisis. So... Here, not only do we need to, of course, switch away from uh, Russian imported oil, gas, and coal because it's our uh, current geopolitical interests, but on top of that, definitely because of these climate crises as well, then the EU Commission has set some very ambitious goals for our hydrogen targets. That's what you're seeing here. Uh, these goals were set in May 2022, so just about a year and a half ago. And the idea is that we should, in the EU, produce 10 million tons of hydrogen per annum starting in 2030 and import just as much as of 2030. And some countries are taking this challenge up front, like Germany is doing that. 
Germany has updated uh, its federal hydrogen strategy back in July this year, 2023. Uh, they've upped their hydrogen production targets uh, twofold. Their industrial penetration targets, meaning here the demand basically, uh, fourfold. So definitely this is moving forward. But France is not following this trend. Other countries are not following this trend, or at least not being as ambitious as what Germany is doing. Uh, so definitely here, Germany is kind of setting the trend, uh, and now we kind of follow because of this energy sovereignty crisis and the climate security crisis. So if we expand the scope beyond the EU, what we've seen over the past three years is that national hydrogen strategies all across the world uh, have basically, how can I put this? There's just so many. There's just so many announced every, uh, every month. It's kind of crazy uh, for someone like me who's been studying this for many years. Uh, it's just almost too much. And we're seeing very various uh, levels, degrees of ambition from one country to the other. What you're seeing on this map here, uh, in green, these are the countries that had some kind of a hydrogen strategy or roadmap or investment plan back in 2019, so before the COVID crisis, right? In blue, light blue here, you've got the countries who were preparing a hydrogen strategy, which was, uh, which were basically published uh, in 2020. That's what kind of happened here. So this was the hydrogen policy world at national levels in 2019, at the end of 2019. Now, what's happening today? Look at that. That's today. That's really literally today. I just updated the map uh, before uh, shooting this video. So what you're seeing now in green is 95, is 59, sorry, 59 countries uh, developing a hydrogen strategy and having adopted it. If you add also the countries in blue who are preparing a hydrogen strategy, if you put all of that together, then basically what you've got here is the 59 countries having a hydrogen strategy document at national level, 39 others considering or actively pre preparing one right now. And then all together, you've got basically 102 countries now actively taking part in this hydrogen institutionalization policy building movement all over the world, 102 countries. All together, they cover more than 80% of the world's population, about 95% of the world's GDP, and more than 90% of the world's CO2 emissions. So basically, if someone tells you, well, is hydrogen just a hype, another, another one, another hype? Uh, is the bubble gonna uh, burst at some point? Well, you, what you can tell them is that here you've got very, very strong policy to market signals that this is not just a game. This is not just a bubble. This is not just a hype. This is for real and this is to stay because it's basically now, from a policy point of view at the very least, too big to fail. From a policy point of view, right? Hydrogen is too big to fail now. So now the big questions, once we've said that from a policy point of view is, from a political economy point of view, who can deliver at scale that green hydrogen? Who can deliver that green hydrogen also at cost? And who will opt it? Well, we know that countries like the US and China will be self-sufficient. We know that countries like India are also very likely to be self-sufficient and even possibly net, net exporter of green hydrogen if, of course, uh, the current trend in India keeps going uh, as the time goes by until 2050. So definitely, in terms of cost, we're seeing as well renewable hydrogen going down uh, to the levels of low carbon hydrogen, being coal with CCS, natural gas with CCS, and that is very much encouraging. And this crossing, um, these crossing trends between renewable hydrogen lowering its costs and low carbon hydrogen staying at the same levels or going up, that's also because low carbon hydrogen, even if it's low carbon, it will be impacted by the um, movement to tax carbon more and more and more and more all over the world, including in countries like China or in other BRICs. So definitely now the big question is, why are we not investing enough? Why are we only having 0.1% of green hydrogen in uh, the whole hydrogen upstream sector today? Well, 
Definitely, definitely there's an investment gap all across the industry. That's what you're seeing on this slide here. There's an investment gap in supply. There's an investment gap in infrastructure. There's an investment gap uh, in end-use applications. And I'm often hearing in hydrogen conferences, we have a chicken and egg problem. Should we invest more in the offer? Should we invest more in the demand? Well, the answer is simple. Got to invest in both. And that's the problem with the policies I've been talking about just before, just a minute ago. They're almost all focused on the offer, not enough on the demand. And that's also one key element of the German updated federal strategy of July 2023. That's also a key element of the new Korean updated hydrogen strategy. That's also a new and very critical element uh, of the Japanese GX, Green Transformation Strategy, uh, published earlier in July 2023. In all of these strategies, these three countries have understood and have put in their policies, national policies, that demand is now becoming more important. Supporting hydrogen demand is now more important even than supporting hydrogen offer because hydrogen offer has been supported kind of not enough, but has been supported quite a lot and is moving forward. Now it's just a matter of time before green hydrogen comes online, comes onto the market. So one last thing I'm going to end this presentation with is norm normative alignment. If we want to have a global hydrogen momentum, we need to have normative alignment between blocks, between countries who will produce hydrogen quite a lot, and India is, of course, one of those, and countries who will offtake that hydrogen, like, for example, Korea, Japan, or the, or the EU. We get to align our norms or certification uh, models or guarantees of origin uh, mechanisms, and so on and so forth. If we don't have this normative alignment, then basically, once again, we will not get to the market targets we're talking about now and we need for this climate crisis. So at the moment, the EU requirements are the most climate effective, if you like, uh, in the world. We've got this additionality requirement, the time correlation requirement, the zoning, there's a certification threshold, which is quite uh, ambitious. These requirements are now being adopted in many, many countries who will produce hydrogen and who are seeking exports, especially towards the EU. Definitely countries like Oman, even countries like Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Egypt, Chile, and many others in the world, they're seeing what's happening in the EU, they're learning about these requirements, and they're slowly but surely applying those requirements into their own national uh, policies so that basically they're is an alignment. And whenever an investor from the EU or wherever invests in a green hydrogen project in one of the countries I've just mentioned, Chile, Algeria, and others, then basically these projects are designed according to EU laws, basically so that these projects are climate effective from the get-go and they will not suffer from more and more norms being applied to green hydrogen and to green energy altogether to secure uh, green hydrogen or green energy procurement in the future, not just in the EU, but in other places in the world, of course. So to deliver on all that, what's needed is strong local hydrogen ecosystems based on these four factors, scalability with proof of concepts, saleability with the proof that the hydrogen is clean, safe, accessible, affordable, especially to the local populations, Security, meaning proving that hydrogen contributes to, sec to energy security and, of course, is safe to use. That goes along with saleability. And finally, sovereignty. The sovereignty aspect will be key, especially in India. We hear Prime Minister Modi talking about this, and he's so right. Everyone needs to produce hydrogen to the most they can for themselves. And if they have more surpluses, they should export. Definitely, that's the only way to get to our green hydrogen and green energy targets. So voila, voila, we need a hydrogen policy ramp up, which means we need the industrial policy ramp up, which means we need innovation to move forward on the TRL scale. And definitely together we are stronger. That's the slogan of the uh, Cleantech Business Club's Green Hydrogen Hub. And indeed, 
it's not just about renewables and green hydrogen. It's about renewables, hydrogen, of course, and the many industrial sectors that could co-develop together with hydrogen and renewables. Here, that's an example from Iceland, talking about aquaculture uh, and ammonia, but you can think about so many examples, data centers, space industry, so many others. And finally, maybe we shouldn't miss on another key opportunity, which is natural hydrogen. So of course, uh, natural hydrogen is just only burgeoning, really, it's even more burgeoning than green hydrogen, uh, but it can be a game changer by 2050. And India surely has resources as many countries in the world are slowly discovering that there are resources, green hydrogen, like a source, primary source of energy uh, in their soil. So definitely it's likely to be abundant and it's likely to be the greenest of all green hydrogens. And yes, it will also require renewables to operate, not as much, of course, as producing green hydrogen as we think about it today, but you will need, of course, some electricity and some infrastructure to get that natural hydrogen out of the ground, compress it, and possibly distribute it. So voila. Together, green hydrogen and geologic or natural hydrogen, well, they are the best friends forever and for our climate. They have the lowest, uh, um, they have the lowest LCOH uh, by 2050 that we can think of, and they have the lowest carbon footprint of all hydrogen value chains. So definitely green hydrogen and natural hydrogen are the key, and to make that happen, industries and policy actors need to work together to now address a number of key market success factors that are quite not, not present enough or not addressed enough in existing hydrogen strategies, including in India, including in France, including in the EU altogether. You have these on this slide. One that is important is specifically the climate impact of hydrogen leaks. Maybe you're going to talk about this in your debates. As a conclusion, I, I hope that this short presentation has shown you uh, with the wealth of elements associated with green hydrogen that addressing the complexity of hydrogen geopolitics or the hydrogen industrial together truly requires a systematic approach. You need to think systematically if you want to deliver green hydrogen projects or a green hydrogen economy or even a green hydrogen civilization altogether. Voila. We have less than 10,000 days to deliver this carbon neutral world. Green hydrogen will be key to that. Thank you so much for all your efforts. And I really look forward to seeing some of you in India uh, when I'm there in two weeks. See you soon. Thank you so much.